To the next paper is uh, Noel Kahn. He's presenting his paper on formation and reaction of isocyanic acid during the catalytic re reduction of nitrogen oxide.
run a steady state. The CO conversion has doubled. The NO conversion is complete, and so is that of hydrogen. And you produce about 1,100 parts per million of isocyanic gas. Uh, that is from 2,900 of NO, about, so about a third. Same thing for CO, because we didn't have complete conversion of CO. And the same thing for hydrogen. So you can convert quite a lot of these reactors to this one mine. Now we've done the same thing for the, the two other um, platinum group metals, supported on silica. see isocyanic gas in all these systems, it's somewhat surprising that people haven't reported it before. And the reason is partly that they use different conditions, but it's more that isocyanic acid is so reactive that you use anything other than silica, you don't see it. And we've proven that by carrying out experiments in which we use, we have a two bed system, the platinum on silica used to generate the isocyanic acid and then placing another oxide downstream. And this shows the result of couple of experiments of that sort. So with platinum silica alone, 1,100 parts per million of uh, isocyanic acid. Hard to analyze the water, but there's about 490 of water for the computer program we're using to generate the results. Uh, if we place an equal mass of ceria zirconia downstream, and that's just an example, we've tried many, many all the water gets consumed by reaction with isocyanic acid and its concentration falls a lot. The hydrolysis reaction produces ammonia and CO2. They have been increased by corresponding amount. Um, if we include water in the feed, uh, so we now have more water than a platinum silica can make isocyanic acid, then all the isocyanic acid disappears to the limit of our measurements and is converted to ammonia and CO2. And you find the same thing with the alumina and lots of other things, and I'll just show a couple more. So this is uh, this is platinum silica, 1100 parts per million of isocyanic acid, nothing downstream at all. We add water to the feed and isocyanic acid even is hydrolyzed to a small extent on silica. If we make the second bed silica, then even without added water, a little bit of some of the isocyanic acid disappears. We add um, water, it goes down a lot more. If we put even small amounts of things like Barium oxide and silica, or cerium oxide and silica. So the isocyanic acid essentially disappeared just as it did with cerium. So almost any oxide will hydrolyze isocyanic acid. Now, we can summarize the mechanistic aspects of what is going on here, I guess, this time. What I've shown there is what would happen if you reacted NO and CO alone according to the generally written mechanism. NO adsorbs on the surface, dissociates to make nitrogen atoms and oxygen atoms. The oxygen atoms are readily removed by a reaction with adsorbed CO to make CO2. And the nitrogen atoms come off as either mostly as nitrous oxide under our conditions, but also as some nitrogen atom. I suppose that the hydrogen would tend to react with 
substantial path is this one here down to isocyanic acid, presumably through NCO groups bound to the metal, which is the thing we have with hydrogen atoms bound to the metal. If there is a support other than silica, then the isocyanic acid will be completely reacted to ammonia. The second system in which we have seen lots of um, isocyanic acid is during the reaction of nitromethane over zeolite type catalysts. And the reason that we study this is the same one that Eduardo Lombardo and Keith Hall uh, looked into um, a year or two, about a year ago. The methane NOx SCR reaction over cobalt ZSM5 is thought to, to have as its starting step the abstraction of a hydrogen from the methane by adsorbed you know, 2 Now, if it went like that, you would form some sort of methyl species. And this, a methyl species, whatever it might be, could react further in various ways. One thing that could react with NO2 to make nitromethane. And that's why we studied nitromethane. And that's why Keith studied it too. Um, the other possibilities include a reaction with NO to make nitrosomethane. I don't know what that would give for sure. And also with oxygen, maybe to give methyl peroxide CO2 by a point. We studied the reaction of nitromethane over a number of different disease, um, zeolites, and this just shows one of those reactions. Nitromethane itself, NO, oxygen, cobalt, ZSM5. And the reaction starts a bit below 250 degrees, and CO2 is the major product ammonia is the major nitrogen containing product up until a temperature of about 350 when it falls quite steeply as it is converted to nitrogen. Now this of course is just ammonia SCR, ammonia plus NO and oxygen to make nitrogen. Um, you would expect from that thought that ammonia SCR would be quite fast over that catalyst that is the case. I'll show you that now. So, this is a collection of quite a lot of experiments, as you can see. Uh, the green ones down the bottom here are for the methane SCR reaction. Methane oxygen here you know, doesn't start until about 350. The red ones are for ammonia SCR, the open ones, and ammonia oxidation, the closed ones. And you can see it's, it starts below 250, complete conversion up around 350. Uh, the square ones are for reaction of nitromethane alone, oxygen, and with NO and oxygen. And you can see it's a little bit faster again. So I don't think there's any doubt that if nitromethane was, say, generated as part of the methane SCR reaction at a temperature around 350, it could run uh, from nitromethane through to ammonia, through to nitrogen without any trouble at all. Uh, now, another couple of points to notice here is that the square points, the nitromethane points, um, they are pretty much coincident whether you react ammonia, nitromethane alone with only oxygen present or with the two present. So that nitromethane just falls apart. It doesn't care what's there. It doesn't need any help. It just falls apart. The other thing that you'll notice is there's quite a deal of scatter. And the reason for that is that nitromethane, if it is run for too long at a temperature below about 300 degrees, and it would be nearly complete conversion, it causes the catalyst deactivate. Uh, this is, as you can 
see I have one student who likes colourful over here. Very colourful. Um, so this is for nitromethane and oxygen, cobalt CSM5, on stream at 285 degrees Celsius. And for a couple of hours, uh, it takes a while, uh, as you know, for the ammonia to break through, but once it does, ammonia and CO2, uh, they seem to be being produced at a fairly constant amount. The conversion is quite high in this experiment, 70% or more. Um, but after a bit after two hours, the CO2 starts to fall, ammonia starts to fall, uh, nitromethane uh, breaks through, and isocyanic acid, these red double crosses, appears. Uh, amounts of about 200 parts per million out of 1,100 or 1,000 or so that would be fed. It doesn't continue to deactivate indefinitely, it tends to reach a steady state value with about 60% uh, to 40% conversion and uh, fixed amounts of both isocyanic acid. If you add water, the isocyanic acid gets hydrolyzed as you might expect. Um, CO2 production is increased and now, that sort of behaviour seems to be typical of most zeolites, although we haven't studied a very large number, mostly because they're pretty slow sorts of experiments. Now, I'll just show you one here for a copper. This is 
the shows the FTIR spec spectra of a cobalt that is amplified disk in the presence of 1100 parts per million of nitrogen and some oxygen, 280 degrees. <coughs> and shows the spectra running out from one minute up to out to 120 minutes. Now I should point out that in infrared cell, the flow characteristics are not the same as in a pat feed reactor and the deactivation doesn't proceed in quite the same way. It goes a little bit faster and it doesn't just show such a steep fall, but nonetheless you can see deactivation. And you can see there's a very strong cobalt um, NCO groups are built up here. And at the beginning of the exposure, one minute, five minutes, and ten minutes, you can see a band, small band here of 1715. And that is exactly where we would expect cyanuric acid. However, between 10 minutes and 20 minutes, there's an astonishing growth of a band here. Uh, it goes completely off scale, 3.2 absorbance, the maximum that we can get out of our instrument. Um, and so it reaches full scale in 20 minutes, but it still must be growing beyond that because the, the band is getting broader and broader along the length of time. So it seems that this species here and not the cyanuric acid must be the, the activated one. Now, with cobalt ZSM5, we cannot make a disc which is thin enough to, uh, for us to find out the peak frequency here. But we did make a disc that, in which we mixed cobalt ZSM5 with silica and in a ratio of one to three, made a disk and then we could see what its peak frequency was. Uh, and you can see it there. Um, nitromethane oxygen, <coughs> cobalt, NCO, small amount of silica, NCO, SI, NCO. Cyanuric acid band is very, very tiny. Uh, this deactivating species builds very rapidly and its peak frequency very dangerous to try and assign a band on the basis of one frequency, especially when it's, got, it's pretty broad as well. However, we have fairly good reason to believe that that species that is present is not cyanuric acid, of course, but uh, this one here, melanin. And the reason why we can be fairly confident about that is that Melamine, of course, is made commercial, and one of the processes that it's used to make melamine involves the reaction of isocyanic acid in the vapor phase with a large excess of ammonia. And it is sometimes carried out in the presence of very aluminum type patterns. Melamine can also be made from cyanuric acid by a reaction with ammonia, but uh, we don't think that's the important thing. I think you'll recognize that melamine is about the right size to block a, a, a channel within um, cobalt ZSM5. It's much the same in size as something like trimethyl benzene, which is about one of the bigger molecules made by the mobile process. Um, we don't think it's melamine alone that is um, there because it would be sharper than what we see. But uh, there are many, many derivatives of melamine there's uh, amyline, amylide, which are intermediates between these two with one or two of the carbonyl groups replaced by NH2. There's a dimer of melamine and there is a few three trimer of melamine as well. And melamine is, um, has been studied. There's a paper by Johannes Lurcher in which he put melamine on alumina and measured its hydrolysis and it didn't decompose until you got above 300. So it is a very stable model. I'll just draw these conclusions from that work that we presented. Firstly, that isocyanic acid can be a major product of the reaction of NOCO hydrogen mixtures over all the platinum group metals that we've looked at, especially platinum, but only if the support is very inert and more active supports give complete hydrolysis to of the high cyanic acid, the limit of the water amount of water that's available. Third 
conclusion is that if a nitromethane like intermediate was formed in the methane NOx SCR reaction of a cobalt ZSM5, then it would be completely converted to nitrogen by HNCO and ammonia. Um, but at lower temperatures, isocyanic acid formed from nitromethane can be converted to melamine type deposits and that causes the deactivation of the catalyst which is so prominent in the system. Thank you for your attention. Any other question? Okay. Thank you again.